Hi everyone, good morning. My name is Nikta Sarkar and I am the CFT Application Engineer here at Katif Technologies. Welcome to today's ANSYS Virtual Academy session. Uh, sorry about the delay in starting the broadcast today. There were some technical difficulties on my end, which is why um, we couldn't start the webinar at 10 a.m. Pacific time sharp. Uh, so apologize for that. But thank you for those of you who waited. Um, we have an interesting session planned for you guys today. Uh, we'll be talking about space claim, uh, some cool tips and tricks and best practices that can make your job easier when you're preparing your CAD for any sort of simulation, be it CFT, structures, or electronics. Um, I know that I have done a past session covering some steps uh, for preparing your geometry um, for CFT, but today's session is going to be more geared towards space claim itself, um, how to use some of the more commonly used uh, frequently um, utilized functions and tools um, that can especially help when you're working with large assemblies um, or a lot of components. So without much ado, let's jump right in. I am going to start sharing um, uh, a screen recording of the demonstration in Space Claim. Now, before I start the session, I wanted to remind everyone that if you have any questions during the AVA, please feel free to leave them in the Q&A session, Q&A box that you see on your screens. And uh, I will be able to take them towards the end of the AVA. Uh, as always, if you have comments for us or feedback, suggestions, uh, feel free to take the survey at the end of the AVA that really helps us get better at these sessions going forward. So with that said, uh, let me start with the demonstration. What you see on your screen right now is ANSYS 2021 R1 space claim. And even before I get into any sketching or designing, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about space claim options. Uh, this is a panel that is not commonly used by many of the newer users, but it can be very convenient, very handy um, if you know what all is included in this panel. For example, if you wanted to change the units of your design, you could come to space claim options and change the default settings. Similarly, if you wanted to change the grid spacing uh, for your sketch plane, you could again come to space claim options and play around with the uh, settings. Uh, for some of you people who might be new to space claim and are uh, more used to a third party CAD software, uh, sometimes the mouse navigation can be a little tricky to get used to. So depending on your convenience, uh, you can come and change the settings and the navigation options um, that'll help you uh, resort to something more comfortable when you're doing your own uh, CAD prep work. Also in the case, you know, wherein you are trying to uh, import different files uh, from other CAD uh, platforms, you can come to file options and make sure that the correct settings are chosen. Uh, for example, you know, if I were to import a geometry from AutoCAD, uh, you know, I want to make sure that all the curves and surfaces are being translated correctly. Sometimes, you know, the geometry looks a bit different when you import it into space claim. Uh, so to debug all that, make sure you check out space claim options uh, to get a better understanding of what you've um, imported. Now on the screen over here, you can see a grid, which is your sketch plane. I want to snap this so that it aligns with the plane on which I want to uh, draft my design. An easy way to do that would be to come to the left bottommost corner that you see on the screen over here, and then left click on any principal axis, and accordingly, your sketch plane will align um, with the option that you chose. Now, if I want to rotate my sketch plane, um, I could go ahead and click the move tool and on the angular arrow, if you double click, then you will automatically get a 90 degree rotation. So now my sketch plane is aligned with the X, Y axis very easily. So I'm going to go ahead and create some random 
geometries and shapes on this sketch plane. I'll start off with a 2D rectangle, actually a bunch of rectangles, just something to play around with and try out some tools and functions. I'm also going to include a circle in the mix. And then, you know, we are going to rotate the sketch plane to see um, what sort of uh, draft we have. So you can see that, you know, this is just a 2D drawing. And as soon as we click on the pull tool, um, you are able to transition to the um, solid mode or the 3D mode uh, from the sketch mode. Now, uh, a good way to recognize that you're in um, 3D mode is to make sure that, you know, you don't see the sketch plane anymore, obviously. And then you can also see these green surfaces, which is the default color. And that should tell you that you're now in the um, 3D mode. So the pull tool is quite commonly used. Here I'm selecting just one surface and then very easily using the left mouse button to drag it upwards. Uh, you can also hold down the control button and select multiple surfaces to pull at the same time. And there are many ways of doing multiple selections as I will uh, explain further uh, in today's demonstration. So let me go ahead and undo everything and then box select all the surfaces that I have created from left to right. And then I'm gonna use the pull tool again to create a consolidated solid 3D geometry from my 2D drawing. Very easy, very intuitive to use, very easy to modif modify or manipulate any CAD geometry that you have on your end. So let's go ahead and make some other sketches on this 3D solid that we have just created. Uh, you can choose the sketch plane at any point um, and a good way to toggle to your sketch mode would be to press the button key on your uh, or K on your keyboard. Uh, that is the shortcut to toggle from 3D mode to sketch mode. And if you have to do a lot of sketching, then you know these shortcuts can come in handy in saving you some time. So here the sketch plane is aligned with the top surface of the geometry. And what I did was I created a circle and then instead of pulling it outwards, I pulled it through the solid domain itself. That ended up subtracting material from my overall solid domain as shown by the cylindrical uh, void that we can see in this geometry. We can also use the pull tool to create rounds. So if you double click on an edge loop, you can easily play around with the pull tool to create a round. Here I've chosen a round of two millimeters. And then, you know, the following few steps will be used to demonstrate other capabilities of using the pull tool. One of the best features of using space claim is the ability to manipulate your geometry easily so I'm going to go ahead and create some extra surfaces that will further highlight the capability of the pull tool. So here I'm creating another 2D geometry, which is a simple rectangle. And once I go to the 3D mode, you will see how it is positioned relative to the older existing geometry. Now notice when I go ahead and pull this surface over here, We get this one solid consolidated geometry and not two different solids as some might uh, expect to be created. So on the left over here in the structure tree, you will notice there's a single solid body uh, instead of two different solid bodies uh, consisting of the previous one and the one that we just created by pulling. So if you take a section plane, which you can easily do by clicking X on your keyboard, you'll see that both these solids have merged even though one was pre-existing when we created the second solid. So this is one way of going about it if you want to create merged solids, 
But what if you wanted two different bodies uh, by using the same pull tool? So let me go ahead and undo everything and then we will create two different solids. And the way to do that is by hovering over the pull tool and then let me go back a little bit so that it's clear. And then choosing this option over here, which is called the no merge option. Uh, when you select the no merge option, you're basically telling space claim that whatever new solid I'm creating by pulling the surface does not automatically get merged with any intersecting pre-existing solids in the domain. So now when I pull this solid, you can see on the left, we have two different solids instead of one merged 3D body. So if I hide it, you can see that there is no intersection or no imprint, no uh, intersecting curves. These are just two separate solids that are seemingly intersecting, but in terms of geometry, you won't see any intersecting curves. Now, another way or another option that you have available to you through the pull tool is to drag a surface or extrude a surface and then use it to subtract any material that is um, coming in its way of intersection. So if I go ahead and play the demonstration, you will be able to understand. So what happened was I pulled the surface and wherever it started intersecting with that older solid, it started subtracting material. So if you choose the cut option while pulling uh, a surface, you can easily use it um, to, you know, modify, manipulate, or, you know, reduce your geometry or dimensions in a certain way. And then again, you know, uh, you can also add material, which will again be better highlighted in a future step. But adding material means that you're basically doing additive um, solidification instead of subtracting geometry uh, from a previous case. So for example, I create a circle on the top surface of the older solid. And then I pull the circle through the solid. Now we saw this a little bit earlier, it'll subtract material. But what if I don't want it to subtract material? I could choose the add option in the pull feature. And now when I drag it through the solid, instead of creating a cylindrical void, it is actually adding more solid material to my overall domain. So these are some of the functions and options that you have with the pull tool. I know people play around with um, expanding or shortening dimensions, but uh, it can be very handy when you're trying to create fluid or solid domains and you know, you're not exactly sure how to go about sketching the exact, exact geometry, then you can use the pull tool um, to remove material from your domain or add more material to your domain as well. So we're gonna do some more operations on this random geometry that I have created. Another option with pull is to use a reference object or a reference line to understand how short or how long um, should the extension be. So for example, if I wanted to manipulate the orange surface with respect to um, this reference surface over here, I could select the ruler option and the ruler option lets me specify the length dimension uh, from that particular reference surface to the surface that I'm modifying. I do see a question 
uh, in the Q&A box, so I'm gonna go ahead uh, and read it out so that you know I don't lose track towards the end. Notice that sometimes when dealing with multiple components, some bodies become gray and cannot be modified anymore. Do you know this issue and why is that? Um, I'm not, I haven't noticed bodies becoming gray unless and until, you know, there's a dimension that cannot be changed as such. Um, or, you know, maybe the full functionality is interfering with some constraints that might already be present in the geometry. That could be one of the reasons why, you know, a body becomes gray and cannot be modified anymore. Um, but, um, Otherwise, you know, the pull function is quite flexible and can be used in different circumstances uh, with a variety of options. Uh, if you do find an example of that sort, you know, feel free to reach out to us and, you know, I can take a look at the snapshot and try and diagnose that issue a little bit more. But off the top of my head, I'm not sure I've seen a case wherein a body cannot be modified unless and until, like I said, it is already constrained um, and, you know, the dimensions cannot be changed. So I hope, you know, that answers that question. So another thing that I want to talk about is the select tool. Um, I know that all of us know how to select objects in space claim. It is quite easy and intuitive to understand. Uh, but when you're working with large assemblies or large components, um, sometimes toggling between different selections can be a little tricky when you're hovering your mouse over a certain section, but you're not able to select the uh, correct surface or vertex or edge. In that situation, what you can do is you can hover at a single point and then roll your middle mouse button, and that will allow you to toggle between the most um, visible um, object at the front and also, you know, objects at the back. So for here, uh, you know, I have selected a surface. This surface is being um, shown over here uh, at the bottom, wherein you can see one vertex and one face has been selected. Anytime, you know, you're making multiple selections, make sure that uh, all your selections are shown at the bottom so that you can verify the number of selections um, while assigning, you know, a name selection or perhaps making any modifications. You can make multiple selections by holding down the control button, very similar to Windows functionalities. And like I was saying earlier, you can toggle between the most uh, front facing and back facing objects by rolling the middle mouse button. Here I have selected an edge. If I double click on that edge, I can select an edge loop. And if you keep double clicking, then it will alternate between all the edge loops that are available to you through that selection. Similarly, if you were to double click on any one particular surface, you could choose adjacent tangential surfaces or in this case, you could go ahead and choose the entire body. So you don't need to individually go and select the faces. You could just use double click and triple click to make multiple selections as well. Now, another uh, often missed uh, option that you have available with the select tool is using box select or lasso select. Uh, in today's session, I'm gonna be talking about box select because you know it is the most uh, frequently used tool, not just in space claim, but in ANSYS itself. Um, there are two different ways of doing box select. One is from left to right, and one is from right to left. Both the selections are slightly different. If you do it from left to right, which is simply holding down your left mouse button, all the objects that are completely confined by that box get selected. So you can see that all the faces that were completely within the bounds of the box uh, are now selected. However, if you were to do it from right to left, even the partially selected objects get selected. So even though the entire 
face was not within the confines of the right to left box, you see a majority of the faces having been selected. So when can you use the right to left selection box? Uh, you know, when you are trying to uh, suppose uh, render a lot of surfaces the same color, uh, or maybe, you know, apply some general modification to your entire geometry, then using the right to left box selection uh, can be an easier, faster way to get the job done. The other option that you have available to you at the very bottom is something called the selection filter. By default, the smart selection filter is always turned on, which means that you'll be able to select anything. But if you just wanted to select the edges for say, um, using the box select, then you could go ahead and choose a filter for edge. And that way, none of the faces or vertices will be selected, only the edges will be selected. So you can play around with the different options that you have in selection filter to see how best they can suit your convenience. So I'm going to go ahead and make sure that the smart um, default selection is turned on just so that you know we don't mess around with the rest of the steps. And then uh, we're going to move on to something really interesting and commonly used. So we're going to again make some 2D sketches on the top plane of this geometry. Here I've made a circle. And the reason, you know, why I have sketched another circle is to demonstrate to all of you how I can easily create patterns. Uh, now, obviously, this is an example case, so it's not um, of any practical value. But when you're working with dirty CAD, um, or you know, if you are working uh, with, say, automotive models, where you have um, a lot of different parts. Uh, that you want to uh, manipulate or modify. Sometimes um, making sketches that are repeatable, that are structured, that are almost in the form of a matrix uh, can make it very easy for you to simultaneously select all of them and then modify them uh, all together. Uh, so this is going to be a brief demonstration on how to create uh, different patterns in Space Claim. So I have created a circular sketch on the top panel. And I'm going to go ahead and choose a linear pattern option from the top. And when I choose linear pattern, it'll ask me to choose the surface which I want to be repeated, which in this case is the circle. Now over on the left here, uh, you can specify the number of instances of that pattern that you want and the pitch or the distance between two adjacent instances. Now, the idea behind making a pattern is to modify them simultaneously, right? So how do I go about doing that? Uh, when I click on the pull feature, I can come and select any one surface of the pattern. And then if I have to manually go and select all the other pattern instances, then the purpose itself is defeated. So we're going to do something uh, smart for selecting these patterns simultaneously. And in this case, there are just three instances, so you could hold down the control key. But what I'm going to do is use something called Power Select. Um, power Select shows up here on the left uh, with different options available to you. What this basically allows you to do is simultaneously choose uh, multiple geometric features that have similar dimensions or similar properties. For example, faces of the same color faces of the same diameter, faces with uh, you know, the same length. Uh, because you know, this surface is a part of a pattern, uh, all pattern members are also um, one of the options that you see in the power select structure. Um, so you can go ahead and choose any of these criteria uh, to easily select multiple instances of any particular geometry. And this doesn't have to you know, be restricted um, to patterns. If you had multiple surfaces of the same dimension, you could go ahead and choose that as well. 
So once I have chosen all these three faces using the power select option, I'm gonna go ahead and pull all of them through the solid domain to create multiple cylindrical voids. And then we're gonna play around with these um, voids that we've created. So we move on to the fill function. Now the fill tool comes in very handy in space claim. When I first started using the fill tool, um, I initially thought, you know, it's just to um, add material to void regions and cover any holes or gaps or, you know, correct any geometries. Uh, if there are bad edges, etc., the fill tool can be used uh, to uh, go ahead and fill that particular uh, gap. Uh, but as I've used space claim over time, I've come to realize that the fill tool is uh, obviously there to, you know, fill a particular region, but it takes into account the surroundings, the adjacent geometry in order to do that. So there may be cases where you, you can use the fill tool easily uh, to cover a region or to, you know, add material to a particular region. But there might be instances wherein you would have to, uh, you know, go an alternate route uh, to add material to a certain gap um, or a hole. And in this demonstration, I have uh, demonstrated both these instances, one wherein you can use the fill tool uh, to complete a geometry or to cover a geometry. And then in another instance, when the fill tool fails, uh, how do we go about uh, correcting or repairing geometry in that situation. So I'm going to go ahead and replay it. So all I did was select the internal cylindrical surface uh, after clicking on the fill tool. And then by selecting the green check mark, you notice that the cylindrical hole is now covered and you know we have been able to close that gap. But what if there was a round? Um, how would I go about filling it up then? Now, it would not be a one-step process, as you can see. Um, the fill tool depends on your surrounding adjacent structures. So I would have to repeat the fill operation multiple times by choosing the internal surfaces to make sure that the entire gap is closed. So these were two different uh, examples in which um, it was easy and slightly more difficult to cover a particular region. Now let us go for a more difficult example of using the fill tool. Somewhere uh, the fill tool uh, might not be that useful in covering the region. So what I went ahead and did was I removed the rounds uh, by selecting the fill feature and then double clicking on the surface loop. Uh, and what that did was it got rid of all the rounds. Notice how the rounds disappeared because the surrounding adjacent bodies uh, were used as references to fill in those regions um, of rounds. So let me go ahead and close the internal gaps as well. And then we can go ahead and create some additional 2D surfaces to clarify my point about how to use the fill option successfully. So I created a 2D rectangle on the top surface of the solid domain and I'm gonna use this surface to create a depression in the solid. Let me also go ahead and create a 2D circle on the top surface. And then we can just go ahead and delete the edges in between the intersection of these two surfaces so that it is one connected surface and we can move it more easily. 
And we're going to use the cut option in the pull tool so that we are subtracting material instead of adding material. So now we have successfully created a depression in our 3D solid domain. Now, if I use the fill tool over here, you'll notice that Space Claim was very easily able to uh, cover this uh, gap region over here. Why? Because it referenced the surrounding bodies and detected that uh, you know I can use these dimensions to fill this area over here. But what if it was a little bit more complicated than that? What if we had rounds at the edges instead of sharp boundaries? Now, when I select the fill tool and try to fill it, you will notice that there's an error at the bottom which says operation failed. And this can happen many times. You know, you could have bad edges, you could have dirty geometry, uh, sometimes, you know, you wouldn't have solid bodies, you would just have like weird intersecting surfaces. In that situation, the fill tool doesn't work because space claim cannot even identify the surrounding adjacent geometries to use them as reference uh, for filling up the area of concern. So then what do you do? So there is another option of filling in material using something called insert objects, such as spheres and cylinders. So you could go to the design tab at the top and select either a cylinder or a sphere, whatever works for your geometry best, and then create a solid sphere in that region of interest by making sure that it doesn't intersect um, with other bodies that are not needed to fill that region. So what I did was I created a sphere that just covered the confines of the area that needs to be uh, filled. Uh, if I were to make this sphere even bigger so that it uh, intersected with the uh, outer domain, then it wouldn't have worked. Uh, you need to make sure that the size and the position of the sphere or the cylinder is as such that it is completely covering the region that needs to be covered, but nothing more than that. And one other thing that you will notice is that now that I've created the sphere, I don't see two different solid bodies. It is still a single solid body. That means the sphere that I created was automatically merged with the outer body. So now when I go ahead and select the fill feature, actually, let me go back a little bit and then click on that surface, you will see that space claim is easily able to identify the reference surrounding regions and fill that gap region. So this is a cool trick for uh, filling in um, bad edges, gaps um, that cannot automatically be filled using the fill tool. Just create a cylinder or a sphere and then space claim will have a little bit more direction as to what to use as a reference uh, for creating a cleaner geometry. So let's go ahead and do something else. What I did was I selected the entire solid and did control C, control V four times. Basically I copy pasted the solid four times, which is why on the left you can see four different solid structures. Now I can use the move tool to move these solids uh, at four different locations very easily as shown. Just use the move tool and multiple select different components or objects that you want to move. Now, the reason why I'm doing this is to illustrate that sometimes when you have larger assemblies and you're working with um, a lot of different components, uh, it might be difficult to toggle through uh, the different structures in the structure tree, make sure that you know only those objects are visible on which you're working uh, and you know hide the ones that you're not interested in, right? So how do you better uh, organize your structure 
uh, for the sake of ease of use uh, or even visibility, right? Now you can do one thing, you can create layers or you can create components. Um, in this example, I'm gonna be creating components wherein I group two of the solids together and move them to a new component. Now, by doing that, I can automatically turn them on and turn them off uh, depending on the group which I selected um, for you know, creating that component that might contain multiple objects. So this is another way to you know, uh, deal with a large assembly or uh, a lot of equipment. Now, one of the common questions that I get from our customers is, you know, I'm trying to do a CFD um, on a very big domain that has a, a lot of different objects that, you know, has a lot of different um, uh, equipment, a lot of different components. Um, how do I go about uh, creating a volumetric domain for such a large assembly where you have so many inlets and so many outlets how do I go ahead, um, you know, selecting all the capping surfaces to capture the internal flow domain? Now, the next few steps in this demonstration will highlight exactly that. How can you create a volumetric domain uh, without having to use the volume extract function in space claim? The volume extract function is more recommended for smaller geometries, simpler geometries, but you, when you're working with large scale uh, assemblies, such as um, a room that has, you know, different uh, objects such as people or, you know, air handling units or fans uh, or different individual volumetric domains. How do you go about capturing the internal flow volume? Because if space claim starts capturing all the individual faces, then it's going to take a long time and it may not always work out. So that is what I hope to, you know, show you guys by the next few steps in this demonstration. And what I'm doing is I'm creating an outer enclosure around these four different solids. And then we can treat these four solids as the inner equipment um, that may or may not be a part of the fluid domain. So I've created a rectangular surface at a certain offset location. And I'm going to go ahead and create a solid out of it, but make sure that I select the no merge option so that when I pull it, it doesn't automatically get merged with the four solids inside it. So you can see on the left in the structure tree, there is a solid domain at the very top. Let us change the rendering of that solid domain so that it is a little bit more clear. So you can see that it encompasses the four individual volumes over here. And these are all different domains with no intersection. Now one can assume that these faces of the yellow solid are actually, say, the internal walls of the room that contain four different equipment. So what if I had um, a lot of different inlets and outlets into this room, right? What if I'm doing an HYAC simulation wherein I have multiple inlets and outlets and I don't want to spend the time in manually selecting all the capping faces uh, to choose um, how my seed face is going to be selected and how my internal flow domain is going to be extracted. What do I do then? So let me go ahead and create some surfaces on this outer domain which I can then treat as inlets and outlets. And it's going to be a little bit more clear as we go through the steps. So here I've created a simple pattern. And then I'm going to go ahead and pull all these pattern surfaces to make it just a little bit easier to understand what I'm doing. So I'm going to go ahead and assign some of these 
faces as inlets and some of these faces as outlets. So I'll go ahead and create a name selection that can be later on referenced in my simulation. And this is another way of, you know, a smart selection, align your geometry in a way so that it's easier for you uh, to select surfaces instead of going over each surface individually. So I assigned two different types of inlets and two different types of outlets. Now keep in mind, this is not a real geometry. This is just to demonstrate the capabilities that space claim has to offer. So you can see that as we go through the list of name selections, different surfaces get highlighted. So we can assume that this is the internal wall of the room in which you have those solid four components. Now, if I had to extract the flow volume, instead of selecting each of the capping surfaces, there is another easier uh, and more logical way of extracting the fluid domain. Um, when I say fluid domain, I mean all the region in this yellow solid, excluding the domain of the four solid components. So basically I'll have to subtract the volume of the four solid components from the larger yellow domain. So how do I do that in space claim? I can go ahead and use something called combine. And what combine does is it allows us to perform Boolean operations on different parts of the geometry or different parts of the domain. So the first thing is it'll ask you to select a target object. What is the remainder object uh, after your subtraction? So that would be the um, majority of the yellow solid domain. And then it is going to ask me for a cutter object. A cutter object is basically the object that I'm going to be subtracting uh, from this overall target object. So I'm gonna go ahead and select each of these four components individually by pressing down the control key. So you select one and then it gets subtracted. A solid body is formed over here and then you hit control and you hit select the other components one by one and repeat the same process. So once all the subtraction has been done, um, you will notice that there are four extra solids that have been generated. Now, it is not necessary for you to retain the domains that have to be subtracted. You could simply click on this option over here and then remove the regions that were created as a result of the Boolean operation. But for the purpose of this demonstration, I ended up retaining these solid domains just so that I could show to you the full functionality of the combined feature. So now if I go and hide all the individual solid domains, and if I hide the original components as well, I am left with the remainder of the domain that is going to be my fluid flow domain in this imaginary room that I have built. So if I create a section plane, you will see that the four solid domains have been subtracted. So for example, you know, if these were four solid uh, fluid volume, sorry, four solid uh, volumes wherein, you know, I wasn't going to run any CFD or perhaps I wanted to assign a heat source condition uh, to these solid domains, I now have different regions um, that I can use uh, in the setup of my CFD simulation. You could also treat those as void regions. That means you know, it won't have any mesh, it wouldn't really participate in any physics. But because I have retained these solid domains, you can see them on your screen right now. Now you would have noticed that you know there was a duplicate 
uh, instance of each of the four, four domains because I also had component one and component two from earlier. So I ended up deleting the four extra solid domains. But before I can do a CFD simulation on this, I need to do a shared topology. Uh, I have explained shared topology in the past, but uh, for a refresher, let me just you know go over it one more time. Uh, the domains before shared topology are not really connected. That means that the mesh that is created in these domains wouldn't really be talking to each other or wouldn't be exchanging any flux values unless and until uh, there's a connection that is established at some point during the CFD workflow uh, for exchanging information, right? So if you have a non-conformal mesh throughout, then you're not really going to be able to get um, a CFD solution for this sort of a problem. So shared topology allows you know, um, energy and mass and momentum values to be transferred from one domain to another. It basically creates a connection on the mesh points. So before I export it to, you know, Fluent or any other CFD solver, um, I need to do a shared topology uh, either in space claim or later uh, in other steps of your CFD workflow uh, to make sure that you have a conformal mesh. So it has automatically detected which of the faces need to be shared. And then after uh, double checking that all the faces have been corrected, selected, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, hit the green check mark. And as soon as I do that, you'll see the edges uh, being highlighted in blue, the faces being highlighted in blue, which shows that you know, your topology is now shared. So very quickly, I am going to transfer this over to the watertight geometry workflow in Fluent, just to give you guys a flavor of how easy this is to set up uh, from a CFD point of view. And you could, you know, export this to Workbench as well and um, set it up using Workbench meshing. But this is just one easy way uh, of doing it. So the geometry has already been imported since we directly connected from space claim to Fluent. And if I insert a clipping plane, you can see what the geometry looks like from within. Now I'm not really going to play around with the sizing, so I've kept everything default. Um, I do get questions from time to time about, you know, um, uh, the mesh quality, etc. And you know, we are going to do a future session with you know meshing be best practices. But this is not you know guidance on what sort of mesh uh, you should use. This is just uh, demonstrating uh, a particular methodology. Uh, so keep that in mind. And then you know one important point that I want to discuss is describing the geometry because we did create so many different domains. I'm gonna go ahead and choose the geometry consists of both fluid and solid regions, assuming that the four individual components are solid zones. You could create them as fluid zones as well, or they could be treated as void regions depending on your particular application. So I don't need to cap any openings because my volume has already been extracted in space claim. And then I don't need to do any shared topology either because that part has also been done in space claim. And remember how I had different types of inlets and outlets. So all those boundaries are automatically populated. And then uh, Fluent estimates the number of fluid regions for you. You will notice that there are five different domains over here. Uh, the bigger one is the fluid domain. Uh, and the smaller individual solid domains are highlighted on the screen as shown. So Fluent is very smart about being intuitively able to guess um, what the domain setup should look like. In case you know um, there is some misalignment, you can go in yourself and change that too. And then I'm not gonna add any boundary layers for this particular problem. Again, just trying to highlight the process and we're gonna stick with the default settings for creating a volume mesh. And 
and within a few seconds, um, you will be able to get a very good quality mesh. Um, and when I say good quality, I mean uh, looks good. Uh, um, but the entire process of creating this domain uh, didn't take too much time. And you could repeat this for um, complicated assemblies that have a lot of components as well. So you can see the inside cell layer. And if I move the bar um, on the clipping plane, you'll see that the solid zones have been meshed separately. So you can import this into fluent solution mode and then specify whatever solid zone conditions you want to assign. For example, if I wanted to specify a volumetric heat source, I could go ahead and do that uh, for those individual components. So hopefully, you know, in today's session, I was able to showcase some of the features and functionalities in SpaceClaim um, that are easy to grasp, but not so commonly used. And, you know, if you use them, then maybe your workflow becomes a little bit faster, a little bit more convenient. I think I see another question. Can I hide or select faces by the angle between them? Like for example, hide the external surface of a car. Um, yes, you could do that. Um, if the surfaces are connected with each other, um, then you know you could select a surface loop in order uh, to you know hide it or you know assign it to a different component that you can then play around with later on in terms of visibility. Um, but as far as the angle goes, you can specify the tolerance in the power select function by going to space claim options and changing the tolerance uh, levels so that power select picks up more faces uh, when it shows you the properties um, based on which you can choose multiple selections. So that could be one of the ways to explore um, if the angle is too great, then there might be uh, a more sophisticated way of doing so. Uh, but that, that is a very interesting question. I can definitely think about it and try something on my end and um, let you guys know. Maybe I'll post it on the YouTube video when it gets posted on our Kativ channel. Uh, so thank you for the question. Um, so with that, you know, I'm going to go ahead and end today's session. And thank you so much to everybody who participated in the polling. And uh, we'll be sure to uh, look forward to the next session. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.